In this section, we're going to look at some interesting aromatic compounds. We'll start with benzene and toluene. Both are useful organic solvents. They're both uh, derived from petroleum products, and they are both starting materials for uh, any number of organic reactions. And so here is benzene, there is toluene. As I mentioned, they're both very commonly used solvents. They're nonpolar solvents, although toluene has a little tiny bit of polarity because of the methyl group. Uh, benzene is uh, a known carcinogen, whereas toluene, it's a little bit easier for your body to process and get toluene out of your system. So it is not as big of a health threat. So toluene has that advantage. Um, there is another compound that's similar uh, to toluene, except it has two methyls instead of one methyl, and that is xylene. This is paraxylene, but there's also metaxylene and orthoxylene. They are often uh, sold as a mixture of xylenes. Um, you can get them at your hardware store. It is a solvent that is used for uh, cleaning up paint, uh, paint strippers, and various, various other things. Um, all of these are going to be flammable, so they're, they're all things you would have to be careful with. There is, um, there, there are uh, what are we call polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. That's where we have at least two rings that are fused together. And the simplest example of that is naphthalene. Naphthalene um, has two aromatic rings that are fused together. And the, the naphthalene has a unique odor. It is the odor that you smell when you smell uh, mothballs. So if you've ever had wool, like wool sweaters, and you you can protect the wool sweaters from moths by putting um, small little balls of naphthalene in the container. Now, they do smell kind of funky, but uh, it's better than having your sweaters uh, uh, complete, completely eaten up by moths. There's another uh, polycyclic aromatic compound called benzopyrene, benzoapyrene in particular. Um, and this is one of many compounds that is produced in tobacco smoke. Whenever, uh, whenever you burn the tobacco, there's all kinds of compounds that are naturally occurring. And uh, one of them that is produced in the smoke is this polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, benzopyrene. And um, this is a fairly potent carcinogen. Um, even when small amounts are breathed into your lungs, it increases your chances of getting cancer. And because it's such a heavy molecule, such a large molecule, when you breathe that molecule into your lungs, it doesn't come out of your lungs very easily. So it is part of the byproducts that comes from smoking. So if you need another reason not to smoke, this is another reason, but this is one of many compounds that are of high risk in tobacco smoke. So we also have uh, some synthetic polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, there are two here, one called helicene. This helicene, you'll see that um, it's got six fused rings together. Um, interestingly, these two are not fused together. So in that helicene, uh, these two are not fused together, so it's actually got a helical structure to it, which makes it not completely planar, but it's still uh, extremely conjugated, uh, so it is an aromatic hydrocarbon, but it's a little bit different. There's another one that is simply called Twistaflex. There is uh, there is an IUPAC name for it. I have no idea what the IUPAC name is, but it's fairly complicated. Um, and so twist effect, it's also non-planar because of steric interactions. And so you'll see that we have sort of this twist to it. And one thing that's kind of interesting about both of these compounds, both of these compounds are chiral, but have no stereogenic center. So again, both of these compounds are chiral, but have no stereogenic center. That means that the mirror image of each of these is non-superimposable. And, uh, and doesn't interconvert between the two compounds. That, that's kind of cool. So um, there are some other compounds that are also like that, that are chiral, um, but have no stereogenic centers. So. There are a fair number of, uh, of medicinal uh, uh, compounds, drugs, uh, that have benzene rings in them. In fact, there are a lot of them. 
Uh, some are quite beneficial. There are some that are harmful. Uh, uh, one that is used effectively as an antidepressant, uh, Zoloft, you may have heard of it. Uh, Zoloft has this structure. You'll see there are two aromatic rings there. Many of, many of the uh, popular used um, antidepressants actually have aromatic rings in them, just part of the nature of that kind of compound. Uh, this compound, uh, Valium, also has an aromatic ring. Um, it, this is an anti-anxiety medicine. Uh, I, again, all of these should be used under doctor supervision, but this one can be particularly dangerous if used improperly. Novocaine. Uh, Procaine is the generic name, but Novocaine is the brand name. It's a local anesthetic. Uh, you will see this used in, uh, you'll see this used in dentistry quite a bit. They'll deaden uh, the nerves temporarily, uh, so that they can do things like put a filling in your tooth or, or, you know, extract a tooth if they have to. So, uh, Novocaine, a very useful drug there. Uh, Fearcept, this is an incredibly useful drug. Um, it allows, or it is an antiretroviral used in, uh, treating HIV. It keeps, uh, um, HIV viral loads um, very low. That it, in combination with other drugs, helps to keep the, the viral loads low and helps people from uh, developing uh, further complications from HIV. So, very important drug. Uh, this one is uh, Viagra, used as an erectile dysfunction drug. Uh, uh, this one was invented in the 90s. There have been other ones. It's now, it's now a generic uh, uh, medicine, but used extensively uh, in the last 25 years. And then this one is Claritin, which you uh, may see as Loratadine, but Claritin is the brand name. It is an antihistamine. And again, you'll see the aromatic drug, the aromatic ring in there. There are hundreds, thousands of drugs that have, uh, that have aromatic rings in them. This is just a handful of them. So Aromatic uh, uh, chemistry is very important. So now we want to look at benzene's unusual stability. So we're going to consider the heat of hydrogenation for cyclohexene and compare it with cyclohexadiene and finally benzene. All of these compounds give cyclohexane as a product. So this is a useful comparison to compare this, this, and this and see how stable they are. When we hydrogenate it, the more stable the compound is, the, le the lower the heat of hydrogenation. So for cyclohexane, or cyclohexene, when you hydrogenate it, it's exothermic by 120 kilojoules per mole. And that's sort of our reference point. So one double, one carbon-carbon pi bond, when we hydrogenate it, about 120 kilojoules of heat is given off. If we have the conjugated system, the 1,3, uh, diene, cyclohexa 13 diene, because that one is conjugated, it doesn't quite give off two times that negative 120 kilojoules. Instead, we'll find it gives off negative 232 kilojoules. Um, there's a small difference of about eight kilojoules. So that means that this is stabilized by about eight kilojoules because of, uh, because of conjugation. Benzene is a whole different story. If we hydrogenate benzene, which we can do, it is exothermic, negative 208 kilojoules. Well, if we, if we hydrogenated three isolated carbon-carbon pi bonds, we would expect it to be negative 360 kilojoules, but this one's only negative 208 kilojoules. That means that benzene has a lot of extra stability compared to other conjugated alkenes and definitely compared to just an isolated alkene. If we put this in, a, in an energy diagram, we can get a direct comparison to see the difference between our observed heat of hydrogenation and our expected heat of hydrogenation for, a, um, for isolated alkenes. So uh, if we just do the three times negative 120, we'd get negative 360 kilojoules. Then hypothetically, that's how much we would release if these double bonds were not conjugated at all. 
with a little bit of conjugation, they do lower in energy, but with uh, benzene and its aromatic system, it has a much lower heat of hydrogenation, meaning that the benzene is much more stable. We're gonna find that this unusual stability is a characteristic of all of our aromatic compounds and something that we are going to talk about extensively later in this chapter. So let's switch over to number seven on the in-class assignment. We've got two compounds. This is an easy question. We've got two compounds, A and B. Uh, they're both hydrogenated to methyl cyclohexane. So these are constitutional isomers of each other. And when we hydrogenate them, they will both give methyl cyclohexane. We want to know which one has the larger heat of hydrogenation. In other words, which one's less stable. And, uh, and then the other question is, which one's more stable? Well, the one with the larger heat of hydrogenation will be the less stable one. So this one has a, a larger delta H. hydrogenation, all right? And when I say that, it will have a larger negative value. And the, the uh, toluene, which is this one, uh, it will have a smaller delta H of hydrogenation, which means it will be more stable. So that would be the more stable compound. So benzene is more stable than typical alkenes of similar kinds of structures. So uh, we're going to say that benzene is a less reactive compound. And uh, it's not limited to hydrogenation. We saw a little bit earlier in the chapter uh, when we talked about uh, um, that benzene does not undergo the regular electrophilic um, the electrophilic addition reactions that we saw back in chapter 10. So if we attempt to do uh, to add bromine across a carbon-carbon double bond in benzene, it will not work. The energy is not going to work. The reason is, in doing this, we would have to break up that aromatic ring, and we're going to give up that 152 kilojoules of stability that we got because of the aromatic ring. And that's not worth it. So we'll find that benzene does not react with bromine to give that addition product. Now, that doesn't mean that it won't react with bromine if we throw the right chemical in there. If we throw the chemical iron 3 bromide, which is a Lewis acid, that uh, iron 3 bromide will help it to do another reaction. That other reaction is called an electrophilic aromatic substitution. Uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution, that is going to be the major point of focus for the next chapter, chapter 16. So there are four criteria that we use for determining if a compound is aromatic. And the first one of those is that a molecule must be cyclic to be aromatic. If you have a compound that is acyclic, it will not be aromatic. It just can't be. It won't work. As an example, here we've got benzene. Benzene is aromatic. By definition, it's aromatic. Uh, with benzene, we, we will see it's uh, cyclic, and that means that each of the p orbitals on each carbon are capable of delocalizing. So we can, uh, we can delocalize the electrons across all six of those orbitals. In the case of uh, hexa-135-triene, because it's not cyclic, there's no overlap between this p orbital and this p orbital on carbons one and six. And because there's no overlap there, we do not get complete conjugation. Uh, we don't get that overlap and, and therefore it is not aromatic. So compounds, in order to be aromatic, each carbon needs to have a p orbital and all, carb all of those carbons need to be on a ring. So it has to be cyclic. First requirement, cyclic. Our second requirement is that the molecule must be planar. So uh, all of the carbons, if we go back and look at benzene, all of the carbons in benzene are coplanar. Uh, but if we look at a molecule like cyclo, uh, cyclooctatetraene, 
which that one's kind of difficult to say. Cyclooctatetraene, it looks like maybe it could be aromatic. We've got those alternating double and single bonds. However, when we look at that structure a little more closely, uh, we'll see because of angle strain uh, that this molecule is not planar. It actually kind of has a tub shape to it. Because it has that tub shape to it, it's not possible for the p orbitals on this carbon and the p orbitals on this carbon to overlap. So we don't get that complete delocalization that we get with a planar molecule. As a consequence, uh, we can do uh, we can do electrophilic addition reactions like adding like halogenation, like adding bromine to it. Uh, this will work perfectly fine. So that's the kind of con that's the kind of reaction that you can do with uh, that's the kind of reaction you can do with cyclooctatetraene because it is not aromatic. So our third requirement for aromaticity is that all of the all of the p orbitals must be conjugated. We must have complete conjugation. Every carbon must have a p orbital on it. And uh, it's possible also to have p orbitals on things that are not carbon. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, but here as an example, benzene, all of those carbons are sp2 hybridized, which means that every carbon has a p orbital on it and is capable of conjugation. In cyclohexa 13 diene we do get conjugation for these two, these two, but because this carbon and this carbon are sp3 hybridized, there are no p orbitals on them, and therefore this is not an aromatic compound. Similarly, with cyclohepta 135 triene, uh, we've got that one car, uh, sp3 hybridized carbon. All it takes is one sp3 hybridized carbon in a ring and it means it cannot be aromatic. <clears throat> Our fourth criterion for aromaticity is called Huckel's rule. And Huckel's rule tells us that, a, uh, that aromatic compounds must have a particular number of pi electrons. And that particular number is 4n plus 2 pi electrons, meaning uh, we can have 4n is an integer, so we can have 4 times 0 plus 2, 4 times 0 plus 2 would be 2 pi electrons. We can have 4 times 1, so 4 times 1 is 4, plus 2 is 6. Uh, and so uh, if we add 4 to each of those numbers, 10, 14, 18 we will find that those are acceptable numbers of electrons. So aromatic compounds are going to have 4n plus 2 pi electrons. If a molecule is completely cyclic, planar, and completely conjugated, but it has 4n pi electrons, we're going to find that not only is it not aromatic, it's unusually unstable, and it's said to be anti-aromatic. We're going to explain that as well here in just a little bit, why that's the case. So here are two compounds, uh, benzene, which we've seen multiple times. In this case, N is equal to 1, and so it has 4N plus 2, 6 pi electrons, so that is an aromatic, uh, aromatic compound. With cyclobutadiene, we've got 4 pi electrons, and 4 pi electrons doesn't fit into the 4N plus 2, and furthermore... Uh, the four pi electrons, it does fit into our anti-aromatic rule. So not only is it not aromatic, it's actually anti-aromatic. The anti-aromatic compound here is going to be unusually unstable. All right, and we'll see how we can describe that, uh, that instability here in just a little bit. So when it comes to Huckel's rule and the number of pi electrons, it refers to the number of pi electrons, not just the number of atoms in a particular ring. That's something we have to be careful about. So here are, here are a few examples of uh, the number of pi electrons we can have in an aromatic system that, that, uh, that satisfy the Huckel rule. 
Uh, so if n is equal to 0, we can have 2 pi electrons. That can be aromatic. Uh, if n is equal to 1, 6. If n is equal to 2, 10 pi electrons. 14, 18. We could do 22, 26, 30. When we get past that, we get into some kind of weird territory there. But we'll, we'll, we'll say uh, uh, 4n plus 2, it goes out quite a bit. Sometimes we're going to find that the atom contributes more than one electron, or it can even contribute zero electrons. So some atoms will contribute no electrons, some will contribute one, like carbon, and some will contribute two electrons to the pi system. And we will see examples of that shortly. So let's look at the criteria for aromaticity to sum it all up. Aromatic compounds are cyclic, planar, completely conjugated, and have 4n plus 2 pi electrons. So it meets all four of those requirements. Anti-aromatic compounds meet these three requirements, cyclic, planar, and completely conjugated. But instead of 4n plus 2 pi electrons, they have 4n pi electrons. Non-aromatic or not aromatic compounds um, they are going to lack one or more of our requirements. They may not be cyclic, they may not be planar, and they may not be uh, uh, completely conjugated. So if they are uh, not cyclic, not planar, not completely conjugated, or if they have an odd number of pi electrons, then they're not going to, they're going to be not aromatic as well. So let's do a quick stability comparison uh, for an alkene, uh, our cyclic uh, uh, compound, and compare that to uh, an acyclic compound and see if it's more stable. So here's the example. Here we've got benzene. Benzene has three, uh, three unsaturations in addition to the ring, and so it's got three double bonds. Uh, and, but it, 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 it qualifies as being aromatic, because it is cyclic, if we look at the hexa-135 triene, it meets most of the requirements, but since it is not cyclic, it is not completely conjugated. So this one is not aromatic. The benzene is aromatic. So the benzene is decidedly more stable than the hexa-135 triene. When we compare cyclobutadiene with just buta-1,3-diene, we will find that the cyclobutadiene it's cyclic, planar, uh, completely conjugated, and has 4n pi electrons, so it's actually anti-aromatic. That makes it less stable than the just simply conjugated 1,3-butadiene. So anti-aromaticity makes it even less stable than a regular diene, similar diene. Here we've got uh, cyclohexa-1,3-diene. It is a conjugated but not aromatic system because it has these two sp3 hybridized carbons so it can't be aromatic so it's not aromatic this um, this compound the cis cis hexa 2 4 diene also not completely conjugated and not cyclic so it's not aromatic so these are both not aromatic they have similar stability so if you aromaticity gives you extra stability anti-aromaticity gives you it actually destabilizes and then uh, if you just have conjugation uh, and it's not aromatic, we're going to have similar stability. One way that we can use to distinguish between something that is aromatic and something that is not aromatic is to look at the NMR. In the NMR, because of the aromaticity, we will find that um, the hydrogens on an aromatic ring are highly de-shielded. And because they're highly de-shielded, they're moved fairly far downfield uh, in the 6.5 to 8 part per million range. And so a typical benzene hydrogen is going to have uh, a chemical shift of, you know, about 7.3 for just regular benzene. Uh, it's going to be down there in that range. If you've got a cyclic hydrocarbon that is not aromatic, Remember cyclooctatetraene, it had it was non-planar, and so these behave more like isolated alkenes. 
And because uh, these act like isolated alkenes, they absorb in the normal chemical shift range from 4.5 to 6 parts per million. This one's at 5.8. So it's definitely not aromatic. So the aromatic ones are going to find, we're going to find out there 7.3. And the not aromatic ones are going to be uh, um, at, a, at a lower chemical shift upfield from this one. And it's simply because they're not quite as deshielded as our regular benzene. So I want to show you a couple of examples of aromatic rings that are not just benzene. Benzene is very interesting and there are substituted benzenes and those are very interesting, but it's possible for other compounds to meet all the requirements to be cyclic, planar, completely conjugated and have 4n plus 2 pi electrons. An example of this are anulenes. All right, so here I've got two anulenes. This one is called 14 anuline. Um, the number comes from just the number of carbons that are in the ring. You'll see that there are seven pi bonds in 14 anuline. Seven times two gives us 14. 14, that is 4n plus two, where n is equal to three. And this is a completely planar molecule, completely conjugated, it's cyclic, and has 4n plus two, therefore it is aromatic. Uh, 18 anu anuline is, is in a very similar fashion, has 4n plus two pi electrons, where here where n is equal to four. Uh, and we will see again, cyclic, completely conjugated, planar, and, uh, and has the 4n plus 2 pi electrons. If we were to attempt to do this with 16 anuline, we would find it would be anti-aromatic. It would not fit in this. All right. If we attempt to go down to 10 anuline, something interesting happens. It satisfies most of the rules. It satisfies the Huckel rule. It is conjugated, however, we'll find that because of a steric interaction between the hydrogens that are on these two carbons, so because of that steric interaction, it is not possible, uh, it is not possible for this to be planar. And because it's not planar, we will find it is not aromatic. It's not anti-aromatic, but it is not aromatic. It doesn't meet one of our key requirements. And because it is not planar, uh, we don't get complete delocalization all the way around the ring. Uh, so we're going to call it not an aromatic compound. All right, here we've got some fused aroma aromatic hydrocarbons. So fused aromatic hydrocarbons, fused rings. We saw one of these a little bit earlier, naphthalene. Uh, naphthalene is the one that is in, that's the active ingredient in mothballs. It, moths hate it. Um, so we can get two or more six-membered rings that are fused together. And as long as we continue to add four electrons on each one, we're going to get two n plus four pi electrons. So we can get those polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, another one, when we have three rings, we refer to this as anthracene. Anthracene um, has three fused rings all in a row. Again, 14 pi electrons, that meets our Huckel rule. Um, and then for anthracene, there is a constitutional isomer of that uh, that's called phenanthrene. And again, same number of carbons, but, um, but the, we get a little uh, a turn there and we get phenanthrene. So we're, we want to look at number 31. 31, this is kind of a cool problem. So switch over. All right, so we've got three compounds, pentaline, azuline, and heptaline. Pentaline, all right, so they're all hydro, uh, conjugated hydrocarbons. We're going to assume that they're all planar. They are. Uh, so that we're going to assume that they're all planar and that they all contain... Uh, they don't contain a benzene ring. There's no six-membered rings in any of these compounds. We've got a five and a five, we've got a five and a seven, and a seven and a seven. All right, so we want to determine which ones are stable or unstable based on Huckel's rule. And then we're going to explain our choices here. 
So here, two, four, six, eight. That's eight pi electrons. All right. Well, eight pi electrons is going to make this unstable. And the reason it's going to be unstable is that with eight pi electrons, that's going to be anti-aromatic. That'll be anti-aromatic. Azaline. Before I talk any more about azaline, I want you to look at that word, azaline, and I want you to think, what color is that compound? So pause the video and think about what color that compound is. All right, now that you had a chance to think about what color that compound is, all right, uh, if you came up with blue, pat yourself on the back, it is blue. And uh, if you didn't come up with blue, that's okay. Uh, regardless, I want you to pause the video again and go look up that, go Google this, Azuline, and look at it and look at the color of that compound. It's a really, really cool blue compound. All right, so this is azulene. All right, so hopefully you had a chance to look at it and hopefully you agree with me that this is a very cool looking compound uh, with a dark blue. So this is azulene. If we count, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So 10 pi electrons. And this is going to be stable and it will be uh, aromatic. It meets the Huckel rule. So it is aromatic. Again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten 10 pi electrons. That's an aromatic compound. Pretty cool. Heptylene, let's count them. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. 10, 12. So 12 pi electrons. If you guessed unstable, you are correct. And that is anti-aromatic. All right, so that is an anti-aromatic compound. It uh, for Huckel rule, it tells us it's anti-aromatic with the with the four four n pi electrons. So four times three gives us twelve. All right, so just to wrap up, unstable because it's anti-aromatic, stable because it's aromatic, also very cool, also it's unusually polar for a hydrocarbon. Look that up too. That's kind of cool. And then heptylene, uh, uh, it's unstable because it is anti-aromatic. When we have fused, air, uh, fused ring aromatics, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons like naphthalene, we'll find that we can write more resonance structures and with those more resonance structures gives us additional stability. So naphthalene, we're capable of writing three resonance structures for naphthalene, whereas for benzene, we only had two. So we do get an unusual amount of stabilization because naphthalene has three uh, resonance structures. Next, we want to look at heterocyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, these are compounds that contain carbon, hydrogen, and something else. And the something else uh, is usually oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur. Um, there are other possibilities. Those are the most common with nitrogen and oxygen being our uh, most commonly observed ones. One of the examples is one that we've talked about before and that we're going to use again in this term, and that is pyridine. Pyridine as you count here, there are three pi bonds, three pi bonds, so six pi electrons. Uh, we also have this lone pair of electrons that's on the nitrogen. That's not part of the aromatic system. Uh, this is a useful base that we use in doing organic reactions. Sometimes we can use this as a solvent, although as a solvent, that's it's, it's pretty strong as a solvent. But we often use it as either a catalyst or we can use it as a base to help promote a particular reaction. Extremely useful compound, it's aromatic. Now, when we have an aromatic system like pyridine, we need to look at each individual atom. The carbons are no big deal. Carbons, we're gonna have a p orbital, and that p orbital on each carbon is gonna donate one electron. However, we need to look at heteroatoms and determine, so like here we have a, 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 we have a lone pair of electrons, and we also have a p orbital, we need to determine, is 
is the lone pair in the p orbital or is the lone pair in a hybrid orbital an sp2 orbital and in this case it's in an sp2 hybridized orbital the p orbital has a single electron which gives us the total of six pi electrons so the lone pair in this case is going to be in an sp2 hybridized orbitals which means it is not conjugated here it's not that the electron density is not delocalized throughout that ring and so we get uh, quite a bit of localized charge on that nitrogen by contrast we can look at the heterocycle pyrrole also an aromatic compound so it's an aromatic heterocycle you'll notice it's a five-membered ring nitrogen is one of the members and then we've got four carbons each carbon donates one electron to the aromatic system. So you'll see one electron in each of those p orbitals. But in order to have 4n plus 2 pi electrons, in this case 6 pi electrons, the lone pair of electrons on nitrogen, that lone pair of electrons needs to be in a p orbital. And this hydrogen is going to be, uh, the hydrogen is going to be bonded. It's going to be overlapping with a sp2 hybridized orbital on nitrogen. So there's an sp2 that overlaps with the 1s orbital on hydrogen, and then our lone pair is actually in a p orbital. That p orbital, um, because, uh, because it is cyclic, because it is completely conjugated, um, uh, because it is planar, we're going to find that this is definitely an aromatic, uh, an aromatic compound. So uh, all of the, all of the uh, atoms have a p orbital. And because the nitrogen is donating two electrons, we're going to find that this is a uh, we're going to find that this is a sex six electron pi system. So cyclic, planar, completely conjugated, four n plus two pi electrons. It is aromatic. So notice the difference there between pyridine and pyrrole. All right. In pyridine, the lone pair of electrons was on an sp2 hybridized orbital. And as a consequence, we're going to find that lone pair is localized on that nitrogen, making it a pretty good base. So we'll find that pyridine is actually a stronger base than the pyrrole. Uh, for pyrrole, that lone pair of electrons was in a p orbital. And because it was in a p orbital, it was delocalized over the ring. And so instead of having that localized uh, electron density on the nitrogen, we have a delocalized electron density throughout the ring. Now, this is still basic. It's still a basic compound. Um, and that, you know, that negative, you know, the, the electron density in the ring still makes it, uh, makes it fairly electron rich. But this compound is not nearly as basic as this compound. So the pyrrole is not as basic as the pyridine. There are some biologically active heterocyclic compounds, so aromatic heterocycles. Uh, one example of this is histamine. Uh, I have a very uh, adversarial relationship with histidine, histamine rather. So uh, that is that histamine is one of those compounds that uh, when it shows up, your body has a physiological response uh, and those physiological responses are allergies. So, for example, you're exposed to an allergen like, uh, for me, mountain cedar. When I'm exposed to mountain cedar, uh, uh, it causes histamines to be released, and I get all kinds of unpleasant side effects like a stuffy nose. Uh, um, that stuffy nose can lead to things like sinus infections. It's it's a big it's a big deal for me. So. During allergy season, for, for me, it's twice a year, but each, each time it lasts about six months. Anyway, uh, the histamine, is, um, histamine is, a, uh, uh, is a compound that uh, signals your body to have some sort of physiological response. In that compound, there's actually three different types of nitrogens, and each one is basic, but they're basic in different ways. So the nitrogen here that's on this, that's here, the lone pair of electrons is in an sp2 hybridized orbital. So it's fairly basic. 
uh, on this one, the, the lone pair of electrons is in a p orbital, and that p orbital overlaps with the other ones to give us six pi electrons. And so it's a little bit less basic, but it makes the ring electron rich. This other nitrogen is an sp3 hybridized carbon, um, and it's fairly basic as well. So we get an interesting compound that does a lot of different things. We can also have ionic aromatic compounds. That is, we can have compounds where instead of having each carbon donate one electron, we can have an anion or a cation, and it can either donate zero or two electrons. In this case, uh, uh, in this case, we've got cyclopentadienyl. So if we take cyclopentadiene and we deprotonate it, we're going to get the conjugate base of that, which is going to have a negative charge on carbon. Well, that negative charge ends up getting delocalized throughout the ring. It forms a, uh, it goes into a p orbital and delocalizes to give, a, it spreads that electron density around the carbon. In fact, we can draw five equivalent resonance structures for the cyclopentadienyl anion, which is this, and these are the five equivalent structures. You'll see that each carbon has a partial negative charge. That negative charge is spread out over all five carbons. That makes this anion unusually stable. All right. So if we look at, there's three possibilities for cyclopentadienyl conjugated systems. One is the cyclopentadienyl anion. And in that case, we've got uh, six pi electrons. Those six pi electrons are delocalized, uh, making it an aromatic system. We have the cyclopentadienyl cation. It has four pi electrons, and because it has four pi electrons, uh, it is anti-aromatic. We can also draw five resonance structures for this, so we can delocalize that positive charge all the way around the ring, but because of the four pi electrons, it's anti-aromatic, it's unusually unstable. And then here we've got the cyclopentadienyl radical. It's got five pi electrons. And because it has five pi electrons, it is planar, it is cyclic, it is completely conjugated. We can draw five resonance structures, but it is not aromatic because we've got five pi electrons. It's not aromatic. So here is something that's really interesting about cyclopentadiene. So here's the compound cyclopentadiene. If you go and look in the appendix, uh, you will find you will find that most carbon or most hydrocarbons that only contain carbon and hydrogen uh, have pKa's that are fairly high. One of the lowest uh, lowest ones you'll find is going to be like acetylene. Acetylene has a pKa of about 25. However, this particular hydrocarbon, cyclopentadiene, it has a pKa of 15. And a pKa of 15, that is similar to like an alcohol, a little bit stronger of an acid than ethanol. That's pretty remarkable. The reason for this is all explained by aromaticity. So the pKa of cyclopentadiene is 15. When we deprotonate that, we're going to form the cyclopentadienyl anion. Uh, and because that is so stable, because that is so stable, that means that this is going to be a pretty strong acid. And as I mentioned, pKa of 15, that is of any of the carbon hydrogen bonds that we've looked at so far, that has the lowest pKa. The only ones that I know that are lower are ones that have carbonyls uh, adjacent to them. We're going to see that coming up in uh, a few chapters later when we're looking at uh, when we're looking at reactions having to do with carbonyls. Uh, but this is this is an unusually low pKa for something that only contains carbon and hydrogen. So conjugate base is aromatic, and that's why that's such a stable base and why this is such a strong acid.
relatively speak. Oh, and by the way, the original compound itself is not aromatic uh, because it's not fully conjugated. The sp3 hybridized carbon here prevents this from being aromatic. It's not aromatic. All right, now we want to look at the tropelium cation. So the tropelium cation. So tropelium cation is a planar carbocation with three double bonds and a positive charge. It has, so it's got a seven membered ring and you'll see that there are three conjugated pi bonds and a positive charge on this carbon. Well, that means that that carbon has an empty p orbital. Well, as a consequence, we'll find that we'll be able to draw seven different resonance structures for this. And the seven different resonance structures are going to be where uh, we delocalize that positive charge all the way around. But most importantly, more important than those seven resonance structures, is that we have six pi electrons. With six pi electrons, it's going, it's going to be aromatic. So this is unusually stable. So that satisfies Huckel's rule. All right, let's look at number 12 and number 16. All right, number 12. Draw the product formed when cyclohepta 135 triene pKa 39 is treated with a strong base. And in this case, we need a really strong base. All right, and then we'll talk about this other question. So when we deprotonate it, all right, let's see if I did that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That is not a very beautiful ring. All right, I'm gonna pause the video and make this into a beautiful ring. All right. I don't know that I made it a beautiful ring, but it's a little bit more like a seven membered ring than I had. So here we go. There is uh, the conjugate base of this. And then of course we'll have B H plus. Uh, it's not gonna be plus. This has gotta be a really strong base. Really, really strong. And then when we deprotonate it, we, we get this. So here, pKa of 39. Why is the pKa of this so much higher than the pKa of cyclopentadiene? So if we go back and look, let me go back a couple of pages here. Cyclopentadiene had a pKa of 15, all right? This has a pKa of 39. Well, the reason should be obvious given the chapter that we're talking about. The cyclopentadiene when we deprotonated it, we formed an aromatic ring. This, when we deprotonate it, we've got two, four, six, eight electrons. So with eight pi electrons, this is anti-aromatic. And because it's anti-aromatic, this is going to be particularly unstable, which is why it's so hard to deprotonate this. All right, now, assuming that the rings are planar, which ions are aromatic? Now, assuming that these are planar is quite quite a jump here. This has to be planar, this has to be planar. Three, three points make a plane. So here, is this, uh, is this going to be aromatic, not aromatic, anti-aromatic? And in this case, with two pi electrons, the one, two, uh, there's not one here because it's the positive charge, this is going to be aromatic. All right, this one has two, four electrons, so four pi electrons. All right, this one is going to be anti-aromatic. All right, on this one, we count two, four, six, eight, so eight pi electrons. Well, eight pi electrons, that uh, meets our rule for anti-aromaticity. So anti-aromatic. And then finally, this one, again, assuming that it's planar, we've got uh, two, four, six, eight, ten. So ten pi electrons. I assume this one is going to be aromatic. All 
All right, and so that is that particular problem. Tropilium, all right. So we're going to stop the video here. And uh, in the next section, we're going to talk about the basis for the Huckle rule. So that'll be in the next video.